Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Wise Decision Maker Show, where we help you make the wisest, most profitable decisions. My name is Dr. Vlad Sikorsky. I'm the CEO of Disaster Avoidance Experts, the future of work consultancy that sponsors the Wise Decision Maker Show. And today with me is Ava Sadegi, who is the CEO and founder of Simba. Now, Ava, why don't you tell us what Simba does before we get into the discussions about remote work and diversity inclusion? Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for having me, Dr. Gleb. I'm Ava, as you mentioned, and the co-founder of Simba. We are Simba not for the Lion King, um, but for symbiotic relationships. And ultimately, what we do is make it easy for employers to design and scale their early career programs, like apprenticeships and internship programs. We're not a sourcing platform. We come into play from the moment they accept their offer to hopefully staying with your organization long term. And we've designed over 10,000 apprenticeship and internships to date. Excellent. Now, tell me a little bit more about what are some best practices that you found for apprenticeships, specifically for people who are working in remote and hybrid modalities, and how that differs for apprenticeships for people who work in fully office centric modalities? That's a wonderful question. And I think the way that apprenticeships, especially in the United States, are being designed are really um, still being created. And there's a lot of rules and every state is kind of coming up with their own plans. But what I would say about um, a program that might be in person versus remote for an apprenticeship in particular, um, apprenticeships are about on the job learning, right? So you're mm -hmm. learning new skills. And sometimes in a remote setting, creating um, an essence of psychological safety might be a little bit more challenging. Um, I remember my first um, remote internship at um, State Department. It was challenging because I couldn't just knock on my manager's door and ask for a question. Anytime I needed support, I had to be very thoughtful about my outreach. Think about, is this an email? Is this a, um, a phone call? And how quickly and urgent do I need support here? So in a remote apprenticeship program for employers, it's really important to clearly lay out forms and channels of communication so that your apprentices are supported and they can be successful in their programs. Um, there was a research that came out that 70% of apprentices who don't complete their program was because of the program training design. So making sure that they're supported in that experience is really important. And in an in-person program, making sure that you also um, create systems, whether if they need access to transportation to get to the training or um, you know, what other types of support they might need if they are coming for an in-person experience. So those are some, just a few high level tips and um, differences mm. between the two. Now, let's think about the young generation coming into the workplace, Gen Z, and you know, the, as they're on getting onboarded, figuring out that early career process, how is that different from previous generations? So every generation has had its own um, essence and its own experiences. Um, we recently gave a webinar um, last year, actually, around every decade and generation and what they've experienced. One thing that we've understood from Gen Z now more than ever is they really care about um, ESGs and the impact um, and really um, are loud and vocal around diversity, equity, and inclusion. And they want an employer who stands up for that as well. So we're seeing that this young talent that's joining the workforce does want to work with an employer who's committed to these um, types of efforts. And also, I would say there is definitely a difference in the way Gen Z versus maybe older generations are adapting new technology and their openness to trying out new technologies. Um, I think that that's something that we are seeing a little bit of a difference. Um, and I think that um, another element that we're seeing is that we think young talent is very excited actually about going in person and having the opportunity to flex mm. at least a few days because young talent right now is craving mentorship and guidance and support. And we do see research that shows that if you go into the office, you're more likely to get promoted and grow in your mm -hmm. uh, field than if you're fully remote. So I do think young talent um, is craving that experience, especially while you know they have the opportunity to get back into the workforce now. Mm. Now, thinking about remote work, hybrid work, and office work, how does the question of diversity, equity, inclusion that you just brought up intersect with that? In so many ways, um, I would um, you know first think through um, how um, you set up your office. Um, enables different populations to have access, right? So if you have 
um, a remote setting that enables people who uh, might not be able to go into the office or might feel um, a lot more comfortable in their own home or work environment or need certain um, you know, parameters to work successfully, ensuring that employers meet um, their talent um, where they're at in order to create that environment mm -hmm. is really critical. The second thing is um, when you are able to hire remotely or think open to hybrid, you expand your talent pool. So mm -hmm. in the past, it was wherever we could actually reach talent. So if a company was, you know, um, HQ in one city, it was all the surrounding universities that they would attract talent from. Now with remote, you can access talent anywhere. I think back to my experience when I was in school in Tucson, Arizona, which is um, a place where I would say there are not that many job opportunities. Hmm. And I did a remote internship at State Department in DC. And that impacted my um, career trajectory um, incredibly because it gave me access to so many more opportunities and opened up the doors. So I think that um, it's important to be flexible, but it's also important to keep in mind uh, from the employer, do we need people to come on site? Because the privilege, I think it's also a privilege to be able to be fully remote too and have that type of environment, right? When you think about frontline workers and the type of work they have to do if you're in healthcare or you need to be on site for manufacturing or your clinician um, or you're in the service industry. So I do think it's, you know, thoughtful to always keep that in mind as we get to talk about, um, you know, the type of work environments that we create. So I've helped 23 companies by now figure out their transition to returning to the office, hybrid work, remote work. And what you're bringing up in terms of the remote work positions is definitely a conversation that every company has. So what are your thoughts about the trade-offs? You're saying people get more, like you had more access through being hired remotely, but Gen Z young people tend to want to come to the office and they have better career tracks, more promotion opportunities, more mentoring if they come to the office. So what should leaders be thinking about when they're weighing these trade-offs, giving access, maybe tapping talent versus the professional opportunity, the leadership development opportunity for talent once they're in the company? What should be the trade-offs and what should they be thinking about? So there are so many factors and really to kind of circle back to that notion of um, a lot of companies are, um, you know, a really a case study of one. Every company is different and operates mm. in a different way. So I think that leaders first need to understand um, their own company and run potentially experiments to become open minded to the way that they can work. I uh, think that it's not black and white at all. And there are no absolutes when it comes to this. Some leaders, if they are going and shifting into a remote setting, might need to set up their office in such a way so there is an investment right up front to be able to enable that and allow that um, type of work environment. Although Gen Z might like to go into the office, uh, research has shown that they don't want to always have to go into the office. Mm -hmm. They like the opportunity to flex maybe two yeah. or three days a week. So I think that I encourage leaders to think, okay, um, what type of talent do we want to attract? Does that talent um, live in our city or do we have to become um, open to attracting talent from other ways? What um, would that do to advance our diversity, equity, and inclusion? Um, would that give um, our talent the opportunity to be um, do, living in areas they'd like to? Can we actually service that? Um, and then I think you know some of the trade-offs might be that um, it can be challenging sometimes to get teams ramped up and feel part of the culture in a fully mm. remote setting immediately. So there are some things that you can do that if you are fully remote as a company, you can design quarterly offsites um, mm. and ways of doing maybe cohort onboarding. So if you do waves of onboarding, maybe you might hire your five teammates all in one day. And so they can act as a buddy for all of each other um, throughout that whole process. Um, but I really do encourage leaders to be open-minded. Um, I know that um, last year we had a, a teammate who asked me about the four-day work week. And, you know, I remember thinking through the process and I've done a lot of research on it. You do have to understand what works for us and what might not work for us and what works for us right now, because that could be different in five or 10 years. Sure. Yeah. In terms of bringing people on board when they're junior recently hired, I strongly encourage my clients to bring people into the office, even if they're hired for remotely for the first couple of weeks, get them trained, learn how people work, how people operate, get that onboarding in, maybe get some in-person mentoring, 
So they build that trust before then working fully remotely. Yeah. Yes. No. Especially what for early you? talent, I would say, right? I think that because sometimes you want to create a, a really important environment where they feel like they can ask for support and help and they're in that training environment. So that's why I would say for Gen Z, especially to double down on that. Hmm. So what are your thoughts about the future of that onboarding mentoring process? Thinking about in the next three to five years with where remote and hybrid work is going and also with the growth of AI, which will likely facilitate mentoring, facilitate onboarding for young people going forward. I think um, it's really exciting because I think there's a gap in ability to uh, fully service everybody who'd like to be mentored. And I often find that there's usually a few leaders at the top and then a whole wave of um, young talent or emerging talent that wants mentorship. So I think that there's an opportunity to also level up your middle management and to get them excited about um, mentoring. And I think AI can do a really great job of um, facilitating almost the administrative aspect of making some of those connections so that when you are in the process of mentoring, you can be fully present. Um, and I think that it's so important because um, to be candid, we're all a little zoomed out <laughs> and it, it can be challenging, um, you know, after a full day of back to back calls and as an executive to have to get into the mindset of being a mentor. So if we can really leverage um, AI to drive a lot of efficiencies so that we can carve out effective times for us to do this mentorship um, and also create a bigger pool of mentors, I think that would be really powerful. Um, but a lot of this is yet to be discovered on how AI can do this effectively um, and ensure a great experience for all. But I am very, very optimistic. Well, excellent. Uh, that's very helpful. Are there any last words with which you wish to leave our audience? I would go back into experimentation and trying and being open to innovation. As a startup founder, it's been fascinating to see um, which companies are open to trying out new things, which companies are ready to take a chance. Um, and so that's what I would really encourage employers to do is, in, you know, innovation is not easy, but it's the only way to learn. So really do try out new things, experiment, and always try to push the needle ahead. That's a very nice note on which to wrap up. Thank you very much, Abba. That was very helpful. Of course. Thank you for having me, Dr. Glad. And thank you to the audience for checking out another episode of the Wise Decision Maker Show. Please make sure to subscribe wherever you check this out and leave a review. It helps others discover the show and helps us improve the show. All right, everyone. I look forward to seeing you in the next episode of the Wise Decision Maker Show. In the meantime, the wisest and most profitable decisions to you, my friends.